All right. So this afternoon, I'm going to be preaching on a subject. If you call a little bit of that from the prayer and um, even some of the songs that we've been singing. You know, I love that song, Hallelujah, Tis Done. It just, it, it, it sums up salvation so succinctly. Hey, praise God, it's done. Amen. What Jesus did for us, it's done. He bought it. He paid for it. We received it, right? Hallelujah, it's done. I believe on the Son. That's what it takes to be saved. It's good news. It's great news. It's simple. It's easy. And more importantly, it's what the Bible teaches from front to back. Over and over and over again, that is the resounding theme of the Bible. We're saved. It's done. It's over. It's bought. It's paid for. There's nothing we can do to achieve it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. We just have to humbly receive that free gift. But there are many people that hate God. There are many people who are wicked deceivers. There are many people who are deceived and deceivers who are going around perverting the gospel of Christ. And there is no end to all of the attacks that the devil will make on the gospel. He'll try to back in works, put works in here, over there, any possible way he can to mess people up on the simplicity which is in Christ. In the, the doctrine that I'm going to be preaching about today and covering and going over is what's known as millennial exclusion. There are some wicked heretics, false prophets out there that are teaching a doctrine, if you can believe this, that believers in Jesus Christ will spend time in the lake of fire or in hell. There are some variations in what people believe about this, but yeah, it's ridiculous. I see some of the looks on people's faces be like, what are you talking about? But in what it boils down to, and part of my title this morning, is Baptist Purgatory. Because this isn't just the Catholics that are teaching, you know, this, this concept of, of having your sins purged and, and people spending time in a bad place because they didn't live a good enough life. You know, there's a lot of other false religions that'll teach that type of stuff, but this has crept into Baptist churches. And even Baptist churches that are trying to associate themselves or trying to mimic or look very close to the right churches. Independent, fundamental Baptist churches that, that, uh, that you know, have good standards, that are trying to be separated from the world, that, that have this outward appearance, that are King James only. Now they're bringing in these damnable heresies. And yes, they are damnable heresies. Heresies. This isn't just they're wrong about something, they're a heretic about something. This is, this is damnable heresies because what they're teaching just shows that they are not saved. That they don't actually believe the gospel. And the reason why we started off in 1 John chapter number 5 is this is a passage that I love to show people out soul winning. Because it's very clear, it's very evident that if you don't believe in eternal life, in eternal security. Eternal means forever, by the way. It means it doesn't end. And we'll go over that a little bit later. The word E is, a, is, a, is a, the prefix of the word that means not. And turn is the root word that means end. It means literally means it doesn't end. So if you think of turn or like terminal, it's, it comes from a similar root or same root. And E, turn, means not ending. The same way that everlasting means it lasts forever. It continues on. So it's, it's basically saying everlasting means it's going to go forever. Eternal means there is no stopping point. It's two ways of saying the same exact concept, right? We believe that to be true because that's what God's word says. Because whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting eternal. 1 John chapter 5, look down at verse number 10. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is true, I mean, this verse says it, but no matter what God, if God says something and you don't believe it, then what you're doing is you're calling God a liar. So if the Bible says something and you say, nope, I don't believe that, I don't think that's true. Well, God's the one that said it, so that, I guess you're calling God a liar then. Very simply, if I were to say some, just tell you some fact, something about my life or about what I possess, what I own, 
I have, you know, five children. I have a, a white van. I, you know, whatever. If you say, yeah, I don't think you do. Or, I, you, I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't think you really do. What you're doing then is saying that I'm lying when I say that I have these things or I possess these things or I'm making a statement. You're calling me a liar by saying, no, I don't believe you. So when we say, well, I don't really believe salvation's eternal, then we're making God a liar. And that's what this verse says. And here's what it says. It says, when you don't believe the record that God gave of his son, you're making God a liar. Well, what's the record? It tells us in the next verse, verse 11 says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. And like I said, I, I explain this so many times out soul winning to people who don't believe in eternal life to show them that they're not saved because many people think they're saved. They think, oh no, I'm saved, brother, I'm going to heaven, but I just disagree with you on eternal security. I just think that it is possible to lose your salvation. So I show them this because the Bible says very clearly there's three aspects that we have to believe in this one verse of the record that God gave of his son. One is he says, he's given it to us. Given implies it's a gift. It's by grace. It's not earned. It's not merited. It's not deserved. It's given. Two, it's eternal life. Eternal means forever. By definition, it means forever. And three, it's through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the only way. It's through Jesus. There's not through any other God, any other idol, any other religion. It's through Jesus Christ alone. If you don't believe any one of those three things, you are not saved and you're calling God a liar. And that is why this doctrine needs to be hammered home because you've got some novice idiots preaching today that, that have, had early on associated themselves with the new IFB movement. And I'm talking about Great Harvest Baptist Church. They have Baptist in the name. They have Baptist in their name. They don't believe in the sainthood of the believer. They believe that some believers are going to go to hell. Wait, how are you Baptist again? Yeah, we're going to call them out by name. Tyler Doka believes these, these damnable heresies. His, his evangelist, what, uh, uh, Just, Justin LeBlanc, is that his name? Does anyone, I don't, want, I don't want to get his name wrong. Is that right? These heretics preaching this false gospel, damnable heresies, and deceiving many. I mean, they started off with their flat earth stupidity, but that's, you know, that's not something that I'm going to be so worried about calling them out. Like, I, I just think they're idiots for believing that. But this just goes to show that, they, um, that they're not saved, and it's even worse than I than originally thought. Because they're teaching these, these horrible doctrines, and they need to be called out. And, you know, they didn't come up with this on their own. Originally, I mean, it comes from the Catholic Church. This idea of, of a purgatory place, of people of believing not being enough to enter into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, I knew that they believed this garbage as soon as they started preaching against the sainthood of the believer and as soon as they started preaching on the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. Because what they're doing is they're trying to prop up their, their final sermon about believers going to hell. Because you have to, see, it's such a severe, such a twisted doctrine. It impacts so many other places of Scripture. I mean, it turns everything on its head. If you're going to try to use any type of Scripture to promote such garbage of people being saved by their works. Because that's what they'll say, oh, no, no, we believe salvation is by grace through faith. But you know where they're getting this from, at least recently. And again, this guy also isn't the, the creator of the doctrine, but in recent times, He's, he's had a big influence in pushing this doctrine. It's Joey Faust. Joey Faust, formerly of Kingdom Baptist Church in Texas, currently of Long Run Baptist Church in Missouri. I don't know why all the cult leaders want to go to Missouri and, and get people on their compounds there, but it seems to be a hotbed for, for cult leaders to go to. Joey Faust, a man who he wrote this book, The Rod, Will God Spare It, which probably wouldn't have even had as much exposure as it had, except... That idiot Kent Hovind went around promoting that book and said, oh, yeah, you got, I don't know if I actually believe all this, but hey, you should read it and check it out. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there to think about. A man that has a lot of clout and influence through his creation ministry is, is even suggesting people go and read a book that says that believers can spend a thousand years in the lake of fire. 
A thousand years. Think about that. Think about a thousand years. I mean, think about one minute in hell. One minute being burned and tortured. I mean, how long would that one minute last? You burn yourself just for a second and that hurts and that stings and that's going to stay with you for a long time. One minute, I mean, think about people who go in a fight, you know, you have 90 second rounds or three minute rounds or whatever, and you're like super exhausted, but that's just regular fighting. You're not just in flames being tortured and having the wrath of God just poured out on you. A thousand years. You have Joey Faust, whose wife and kids left him, by the way, still pastors a church. I don't know what people have to do to say, uh, I don't think this guy's biblically qualified anymore. Why? Be careful. Be careful who you get your doctrine from. All the people that I'm mentioning now, none of them are qualified to pastor. Not one. Doka, he's got one child, not two. Now, he doesn't have children. He doesn't have faithful children. I mean, who knows how faithful they are. They're, they're, it's, the one he has is little. He hasn't been proven. Obviously, he's a heretic. He's already preaching false doctrine. You've got Ken Hoven, who's been, who knows how many times now, I mean, he was married one time until he got divorced and then supposedly married, which doubt that ever actually really took place. And now she's gone and now he's got another wife. And oh, he's got a ministry, right? He's not a pastor. Yeah, yet he holds church and, you know, leads the teaching and preaching and everything else. And, and they actually congregate together and they have a church. But, he, you know. And then you, and you've got Faust. So like what, what, people just apparently have no standards. Watch out for who you get your teaching from. God put requirements in there for pastors for a reason. But we're going to destroy this doctrine today. And something like this, like I said, it, it has so many repercussions, so many impacts. So there's no way we're going to get to everything. We're just going to deal with a lot of the just the simple answers that should be really easy to just refute. They go into verses that will be, um, in some cases, a little bit harder to understand. But I'm going to treat this the same way that I would treat James 2 with anybody that's, that has a problem with James 2. You can disprove work salvation from James 2 by showing all of the other very clear scriptures that just say salvation is not of works, right? It's just by faith. You don't have to let one verse kind of trip you up that you don't know exactly what that one verse means because they like turning to the verses and trying to then use their own man-made logic into those verses. That's what the Calvinists do too. They... they, they they really delve into this logic, all built on a false premise. So they try leading you down this whole road and, and they start, you know, um, propping it up with, with some things that will make sense the way they're propping it up, except their foundation is wrong. They started off going the wrong path. So what I'm trying to explain here is this, there is a board over here. I can't really write on that one though. You've got a path. Let's say this line is the right path, right? This makes sense. It's going to follow right along with Scripture. When someone makes an angle and starts going this way, there's your number one problem right there when you, when you, start tur when you turned from the truth. Now, if you're going along this path, you might be able to find some things to keep this line straight going this way, but it's still going straight in the wrong direction. You have to go back to the source. So what I'm saying is, you know, these people will, will prop up where once you've already gone down that path, you can start seeing things going a certain direction, but watch out for where it goes really, really wrong right in the beginning. So we're going to be looking at the simple verses that will show you this is really, really wrong and really bad because it contradicts so many other verses that even if you don't understand a simple verse, and, and I don't think they're that difficult, but they'll use verses like, um, uh, uh, like in Mark 
where, where the Bible, where Jesus is saying, you know, if your right eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for you to, you know, go to, to be blind or whatever, go than, to, than to go into the lake of fire where you know, or go to hell where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, right? I, obviously, I don't have the, the verse completely memorized accurately, but um, you should know the verse that I'm talking about there. And they'll say, see, look, he's talking to believers here. So how would we be talking to believers, telling them to pluck out their eye to avoid going to hell if they couldn't really go to hell, right? And they use that type of logic. And before you get too caught up with that, and by the way, this is exactly the way that dispensationalists will twist the scripture too. They get so focused on, well, and I'm not saying it's not important to know who the, you know, who, who the, the person is talking to and who the person is that's talking but they really take this to a whole nother level to try to twist their doctrine and make, to give it a different meaning than what it actually has. Like it's, like it's some hard concept to understand that God actually knew that this was going to be, you know, that his words were going to be eternal and that it, it wasn't just going to be that one person that's being spoken to that hears those words. That it is going to be for other people, saved and unsaved, to hear this book, Right? Of course it's going to be heard by unsaved people because how else are you going to get saved other than by hearing the word of God? So yes, one of the intended audiences for the Bible are unsaved people as well as saved people. So you can't just throw out passages, oh, well, this was only, you know, he's only talking to believers here, warning them about hell. No, he's warning about hell, knowing that many other people are going to be reading this, that this is going to be preserved, that this is going to continue on. You don't have to get so hung up on something like that. But this idea of purgatory. So you think of, you, when I hear purgatory, I just think Catholic. It's Catholic doctrine. I mean, they're the only ones that'll just go out and be like, oh yeah, well, you go to heaven, hell, or purgatory, as if those are the three places that you, could, that, that you may end up. And they'll say most people end up in purgatory. Because they're not really that bad to go to hell, but they're not really good enough to go to heaven, so they just end up in purgatory for a while. And the, the, their concept of purgatory is that your sins just get purged. They get cleansed. So like, you weren't quite good enough, but you don't just deserve an eternal punishment. So God's just going to punish you for a while, punish you for a while, punish you for a while until those sins just get purged away. Well, the reason why that's ridiculous and, and how that contradicts Scripture so clearly is like in Hebrews chapter 1, turn if you would to Revelation chapter 1, Hebrews 1, 3, the Bible says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ purged our sins. By, we don't need an extra purging unless you're saying that, well, what Jesus did didn't really purge all of my sins. It really wasn't enough. Him dying on the cross, his soul going to hell, him raising, being risen again from the dead, that really wasn't enough to pay for my sins. I actually need an extra purging. I need to go to hell myself to get the rest of those sins purged out that Jesus couldn't quite, you know, didn't do enough to take away. That's what this doctrine teaches. And I don't care if you say, oh, well, I don't believe the way that the Catholics believe about that. I'm just saying that you won't be able to inherit the kingdom. I'm just saying you'll be, you'll be left out of the kingdom for a thousand years, but then ultimately you'll still be back in the presence of God. You still have your salvation. It's wicked. They don't believe that Jesus had by himself purged our sins. If you think that a believer can go to hell. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Washed us. You're washed. It means you're clean. You're pure. Now, if the blood of Jesus isn't enough to wash you from your sins, if you believe that, then I'll tell you what, a thousand years in the lake of fire still won't purge you from those sins. You're going to be in there a lot longer than that. You might think it's only going to take a thousand years. Uh-uh. No, if you, if you think that that's not enough, be prepared to spend an eternity in that lake of fire.
one of the places that these works salvationists like to turn to are verses like 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And as with all false teachers, and just, uh, just remember this always, when someone wants to tell you something that is contrary from the good doctrine that you know that you've received, especially in terms of like salvation or anything like that, never let them just quote you a verse without turning to the passage yourself to see everything in context. Because they love to take one verse out of context. And I would say probably 100% of the time, if you just continue reading a little bit earlier or a little bit later, the full explanation and the meaning is given around that one, that one verse, that one passage. 1 Corinthians 6 is a great example of this. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. All the work salvationists will turn to this passage or one similar to it because there's a few other places that will give you a similar list. So see, look, you can't, you can't be a drunkard, you can't be do this sin, you can't do that sin, because if you do these sins, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Well, you know what? It's very easy to understand what this verse is talking about when it says this, because if you read the very next verse, which they don't like to ever show you, the next verse that comes right after that list of sins, that says, and such were some of you, but ye are washed and ye are sanctified. See, in Revelation 1, Jesus Christ, we saw, he's the one that washes us from our sin through his blood. We have committed same sins, but when you, when you put your faith in Christ, you are washed. You are no longer seen as an extortioner, as a drunkard, as a fornicator, as any of those things because the blood of Jesus has cleansed you. So in God's eyes, when he's determining, who am I going to allow into heaven, into the kingdom of God? Who's going to get in? Who's going to have access? And he sees a believer... He sees the blood of Jesus that has washed all of their sins. Not only that, he sees the righteousness that Jesus Christ did because the moment you put your faith in Christ, you are in Christ. And he is in you. And you are no longer, it has nothing to do with your own works. It's the only way you can gain entrance. It's also interesting to note when we're talking about the kingdom of God, how many times the kingdom of God is referred to as being an inheritance. And again, the concept that an inheritance is earned or merited by how well you live demonstrates that you're turning scripture on its head and you don't even understand basic words and basic concepts like an inheritance. You know who receives an inheritance? A child from the family. When do you ever receive an inheritance in this lifetime? When somebody dies, right? An ancestor dies. A grandparent, a parent, someone in your family dies. And why are you an heir? Because you're a, a relative, you're a family member, you're in the family, so they leave what they have to you. We, are, we have an inheritance from the Heavenly Father. The kingdom of God is that inheritance because when you're born again, you're born into God's family, you become a child of God. Once you're a child, you're an heir. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And there's so many scriptures that are going through my head right now that, that prove that to be true. We don't even have enough time to go to all of them because this is such a common theme and thought throughout the Bible. To, but for someone to say, oh, no, no, see, you can't inherit it. You, you don't get that inheritance because you've sinned. But, they say, but, but don't worry, you're still a child of God because you'll still go to heaven one day. but I don't get the inheritance. I thought I was a child. If believers can still go to hell or the lake of fire, and again, I'm going to use those terms synonymously 
There is a difference. There is a distinction. Okay, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Probably if there's enough time at the end of the sermon, we'll cover Revelation 20 and the lake of fire and the second death and stuff like that. Okay, there is a difference. The lake of fire is outer darkness. Hell right now is located in the center of the earth. One day hell is going to be relocated to the lake of fire. Okay, it's not that big of a deal. It's the same judgment, punishment, everything. It's just the location of a very fiery place. Okay, so I'm going to use these interchangeably. I don't want people saying, oh, well, you didn't really... Yo, that's not exactly what I believe. You don't, you're, you're misrepresenting me. It's a, if you're being burned and tortured and tormented, it doesn't matter if it's in hell or lake of fire. I don't care where you say it is. I don't know what you're saved from if you say a person is saved and they're burning in hell. But seriously, what are you saved from? In Jude, the Bible says, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, right? Talking about be, someone being saved, save them with fear, pulling them out of the fire. So what are they being saved from? They're being saved from the fire. What fire? The fires of hell. When someone gets saved with fear, according to Jude, they're being pulled out of that fire. That's what they're being saved from. They're being saved from hell, from that punishment. And it's not just the eternal punishment, because that's the only punishment of hell that there is. It's only eternal. It's never temporary. You don't have temporary damnation and, and postponed eternal life. You either have eternal life or eternal destruction, eternal death. Those are the two options. It's very simple. God didn't make it confusing. Life, death, good, bad, right? Heaven, hell. That's it. The Bible says in Matthew 121, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Are we saved from our sins or not? Romans 5, 8, But God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. This is what the Bible says that we're saved from. We're saved from the fire, we're saved from our sins, and we're saved from wrath. If you are experiencing God's wrath in fire, how can you say you're saved? You're not saved! You either have eternal life or you don't. Just like we started in, in 1 John chapter 5. We talked about God giving us eternal life. It says, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's a very simple concept. You either have Jesus or you don't. You don't kind of have him. You don't have him part. You, you, you either have Christ or you don't. Your faith is either in him or it's not. If your faith is in Christ, you, are, you have life. You have life. And if you don't have Christ, you don't have life. It's as simple as that. And that's why we use 1 John 5.13. Again, another verse used frequently out soul winning to let people know, hey, you can know for sure that you have eternal life. Because the Bible says you can know for sure. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Hey, if you believe in Jesus Christ, those of you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I know I have eternal life. I don't question it. I don't doubt it. And if you don't have life, then you're going to go to the place of death. But I have life, and it's eternal. But you see, the way that they try to twist eternal life is they come up with this different concept that's not found in Scripture, and they'll say, oh, you're saved in eternity. If anyone ever tries to tell you, oh, you're saved in eternity, watch out for that person and mark them. Because they're probably believing in this doctrine right here. The word eternity is only used one time in the entire Bible, the word eternity. And I'll read it for you. The Bible says in Isaiah 57, 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. So it's saying that God inhabits eternity. God does. It's the only reference to the word eternity. Whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to receive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now, if the concept of being saved in eternity versus having eternal life is so important, then why is that word only mentioned one time in the whole Bible, yet 
saying something is never ending or lasts forever is what's always used when it comes to salvation. This verse doesn't talk about, isn't, isn't talking about someone being saved and inhabiting eternity. Because what they try to do is they'll tell you, well, no, no, you see, we still believe in eternal life. We still believe in one saved, always saved, because eternally or in eternity, you'll be saved. So after those thousand years, you know, you, you, you're, still, you're still saved for eternity. You're still going to be in heaven for eternity. So that's how they try to justify all of the other scriptures that use words like eternal life, everlasting life. The problem with that, though, is that when a person is in hell, they're considered dead. They're not alive. People that have life, people who have eternal life are not in hell right now. They're all considered dead. And you can see that, too, at the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. The, the dead are delivered up. The dead are judged by their works. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. It, does, it didn't deliver up the people who are alive. You remember Jesus Christ said that God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. We saw about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's the God of the living. Why? Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. Why? Because they have eternal life. They're alive. Solomon is alive. David is alive. The prophets are alive. They're not dead. Physically, their body is dead, but they are alive with eternal life. But any Ahab is dead. Any wicked person from the Bible, any wicked person from any time that's not here on this earth anymore, that didn't put their faith in Christ, they're dead and they're in hell. And their soul will be eternally dead. They have consciousness and experience pain, but they are defined as being dead. Because life and death are opposites. <laughs> you can't consider, because then life would have no meaning. If you say, well, they're all alive. Well, then what is eternal life? Why, why would I have to put my faith in Jesus to have eternal life if people in hell have eternal life? It's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Very simple concept to grasp. There's one of two places to go to after physical death. Turn if you go to Matthew 25. I'll show you this verse real quick. And then I'm going to blow through a bunch of verses in John that should just, without question, destroy such a ridiculous concept of a believer going to hell for any length of time, even for one second. Matthew 25, we're going to look at verse 45. Matthew 25, verse 45, the Bible reads, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Now, this whole passage of Matthew 25, prior to this, it's where Jesus is talking about, you know, well, I was in jail and you visited me. You know, I was sick and you, you know, helped me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was hungry and you gave me food. You know, naked and you clothed me and all this stuff. Again, it's another passage that a lot of work salvationists like to turn to because they're saying, see, you've got to do all of these things in order to inherit the kingdom of God. But the reason why I'm turning this passage is in verse number 46. It says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So what he's saying, and the reason, follow me on this, the people who don't do those things that he was stating, he says they're going into everlasting punishment, not temporary punishment punishment because this idea of a baptist purgatory is a temporary punishment it's this well you didn't do all the good things yeah you were saved but you didn't do all the good things so you're going into temporary punishment you're going into time out and lake of fire until that millennial kingdom's over and then we'll release you back into general population but the bible says no you're going into everlasting punishment you're going to be punished forever but the righteous into life eternal. And why are we righteous? Is it because we're so good and because we follow everything? Even the people that were righteous were saying, Lord, when did we do these things? They've got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
When you're in Christ, when you put your faith in Christ, you've got his righteousness. He's done all the good works for you. Watch out for people making very simple biblical concepts confusing. What is so difficult, so hard to understand about verses like John 3, 18? He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You're either condemned or you're not. I don't know about you, but if I, if, if I were to be cast into hell for any length of time, I, I think that's a condemnation. I can't think of anything worse or any other worse way to be condemned than being and burning in hell. I don't see how this can possibly fit by saying, well, but I believe on him. Oh yeah, you're not condemned. Is, uh, I can say, God, I believe on the son as you're burning in hell. And he'll be like, yeah, you're not condemned. Don't worry. Just stay in there for a while. You're not ready to come out. You didn't purge all of your sins yet. I thought I wasn't condemned. Oh, yeah, you're not. That's ridiculous. But you see, what they do, you know, here's, how they, here's how they spin it. Before I get into the rest of these verses, here's how they spin it. They'll say, well, I mean, you're, you're saved, right? So that means all your sins are paid for, right? Well, what if you sin now? Isn't, isn't God going to punish you? Right? So you'll be like, well, yeah. You know, can you just get away with all of your sins and nothing ever, is ever going to happen to you? There's no consequence of your sin? Well, no, of course, there's consequences. They'll say, see, so what we're saying is just that, yeah, you could continue to have consequences after you die, but ultimately you're still saved. Well, no, there's a, there's a serious problem with that. Why does God punish us? First of all, does God send us to hell when, for every sin that we commit here? Just, just automatically, which is like once you commit that sin, now you're gone? No, he doesn't do that. But what he does with his children is he disciplines them and corrects them. The purpose for us to be punished for sins that we commit that have eternally been paid for by Jesus Christ, that Jesus paid the ultimate price and punishment for those sins, the reason why we would receive any other punishment for those sins in this life is to correct us, to get us back on the right path. It makes sense to steer us back to God, right? God will afflict us to bring us back to him when we screw up. When my kids screw up and they get a spanking, the point is so that next time they don't screw up again and they can do what's right. We need that while we have the flesh because the flesh wants us to sin. But what do you need correction for when you don't have the flesh and you're just left with the soul and spirit. When you're just left with what's born of God that cannot sin, according to 1 John chapter 3 and 1 John chapter 5, whatsoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That's what the Bible says. Your new spirit, that new man, that born again creature, behold, all things that become new, doesn't sin. So when your flesh is buried in the ground, why would your soul and spirit be punished to correct you? Be like, but God, I'm not going to do anything wrong anymore. I can't because I don't have that sinful flesh anymore. What would be the purpose? It doesn't make any sense. But see, that's how they try to spin it. John, I'll just read these for you. You don't have to turn to all these places. Uh, John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Never die. If you never die, how could you ever go to the place of the dead? How can you see the second death if you're never going to die? John 6, 58, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat men and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Live forever. John 5, 24, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that heareth my word and believeth in him that sent me, hath everlasting life. You have it right now. It's going to last forever. And by the way, you shall not come into condemnation, as we were talking about earlier, not being condemned, but is passed from death unto life. You've already passed from death unto life. What is death talking about in that verse? It's talking about dying and going to hell. You've passed from death unto life because now you have eternal life and you'll never see that death. 
You'll never go to the place of death. You'll never go to the second death. You've already passed. It's done. It's over. Hallelujah, it is done. I believe on the Son. John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He says, I will never cast you out. But what happens to the people that go to the lake of fire? They're cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse number 14. Read it sometime. They're cast out. Outer darkness. Jesus says, I'll never cast you out. Never. Well, unless you do some really bad sins. Uh, unless you fornicate. Uh, unless you, you know, these people that believe this, they're so full of pride. It, it's very similar to the people that believe in this holiness, sinless perfection, right? Oh, you must think you're so good that your sins really aren't that bad for you to think that these Christians are going to go to hell, but I'm not. I'm, no way. I go to church. I help people out. <laughs> I'm really trying to do what I'm supposed to do. But those guys, they're going to hell. It's so stupid. Like, if that were the case, where, where's the dividing line? How is that just? Was that going to be just? What about one person who just barely makes it? But if they were to commit one more sin, man, they would have spent a thousand years in hell. So it's either a thousand years of hell or nothing or the kingdom of God. Like, and, and it's just a matter of, of weighing up those sins. It's, it's a stupid doctrine. John 4, verse number 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Another verse, it says they're never going to thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Let me ask you this. If you were to die and go to hell, do you think you might be a little bit thirsty? If Jesus were to cast you into the lake of fire even for a minute, and you have flames burning all around you. Do you think there's a lot of moisture in hell or in the lake of fire? I know it's called a lake, but it's a lake of fire. It's not a lake of water. Oh, wait, you know what? Actually, the Bible tells us. Imagine that. The Bible tells us that you'll be really thirsty. We have an example of the rich man who died in Luke chapter 16. And what did he ask for? Send Lazarus! That he could, he could dip his finger in water and I could just have a drop of water from the beggar's fingertip into my mouth because I'm tormented in this flame. But Jesus, I thought you said I would never thirst. Oh yeah, that, that was just talking about like in eternity. I mean, when I said never, I didn't actually mean never. I just meant never after the millennial reign. After I rule on the earth for a thousand years and you're just burning and being tortured. Yeah, I know you put your faith in me and I die on the cross for you and everything. But, you know, after that, after a thousand years, then you're never going to thirst. It's nonsense. Turn your foot to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're almost done. I'm cutting out a lot of stuff. There's a, there's a lot. There's so much to go into in this, in, in a doctrine. Like just because it, it has so much impact and there's so many scriptures that just totally refute what's being taught. We already read 1 John chapter 5, but even verse number 1 in 1 John 5 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. We believe that. 1 John 13, uh, 1 John, or not 1 John, John chapter 1, verse 13 says the same thing. As many as received him, to them gave you powers to become the sons of God, even in that believe on his name. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That's how we become a child of God. We are children of God. And because we're children, you know, God loves his children and we are not appointed to wrath. First, the first Thessalonians chapter 5 teaches us that. Verse number 5, the Bible reads, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of 
darkness. So what's this talking about? It's talking about the source. So it says children of light. Jesus is the light. When you're born again, you are children of that light. You're brought forth of that light. And he's saying, look, you're all children of light. Why? Because they all put their faith in Christ. So now you're children of light. You are not of the darkness. You're not from that wickedness. You're not a child of Satan. You're a child of God. Simple, right? Verse number six. Therefore, so because of this, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Hey, we should, we should be doing the right thing. Let's, let's watch. Let's be sober. Let's get in the fight. Let's, be, let's act like children of light because that's what we are. Verse number seven. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Again, us, it's the same context. Verse number five. Us, the children of light, the children who are born again. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. That Look at this. That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So those that sleep, sleep in the night. Those that are children of darkness are doing themselves in the night. They're sleeping. You know what say? We, we should, as children of light, we should be awake. We should be sober. We should be vigilant. We should be doing good things. We should be serving the Lord. But hey, you know what? Because you're still a child of light, whether you're sleeping or awake, whether you're doing what you're supposed to be doing or not doing what you're supposed to be doing, we should live together with him. That's what the Bible teaches. We're going to live together with him. Not in some eternity concept that's just way out in the future. It's we're going to live with him. Yes, and when he comes to rule and reign on this earth, we're going to live with him. When he comes back with all of the saints. And see, that's why they teach this doctrine. Well, not everyone's a saint. Because they have to teach this other doctrine of, well, you're, you know, he's coming back with all of his saints. And he's not leaving anyone up back up in heaven, so where are the other people going to be? Oh, well, they're going to be in hell. And then you ask these people, where are they going to be in the meantime? Right? I mean, Jesus Christ hasn't set up his millennial kingdom. Then you get into all kinds of other weird stuff. Then you get into the mixture of like soul sleep, or, well, they're in Abraham's bosom, but wait, there is no more Abraham's bosom. Wait, I don't know. Are they in heaven? So yeah, wait, they go to heaven because they're saved, but then at the millennial reign, then they're going to be taken from heaven and cast into hell just for that thousand years, and then they're going to come back out of hell. How does that make sense? But then you might say, well, I guess then they do go to hell, and then they're also still in hell for that thousand years. So man, wouldn't that suck for those believers that died like in the flood, right? That, that weren't living for God and not doing right to just spend all of those thousands of years in hell, and then they got another thousand years to face. But man, at least you're lucky to be like living near the end times to only have to have a thousand years in hell as, as a not very good believer. The doctrine is dumb. It's not just. It doesn't make sense. It's not the way God operates. It's all or nothing with God. You either are perfect and you can earn your way into heaven or you're a sinner and you deserve hell. That's it. That's why we all need a Savior. And the Savior died once for all, for everybody. And once that atonement's been made, it's applied for you that whether you wake or sleep, we should live together with him. All right, I want to cover this. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2. Of course, you've got the, the messages to the churches, various churches. John writes these letters, the Word of God. And you'll see multiple references to, to him that overcome, right? Him that overcometh. And the, the work salvation crowd, i.e., those that believe in millennial exclusion, exclusion or those that believe Christians go to hell, they're work salvationists. I don't care if they say, no, we don't believe work salvation. Yes, you do. The Lordship salvationists say, we don't believe in work salvation. Yes, you do. Those are the people who say, well, you have to repent of all your sins and be saved. Well, we don't believe in work salvation. Yes, you do. It doesn't matter if you deny it or not. It's inherent to your belief. If you believe any of those things, you're not saved because you're trusting in works to some degree or another. I don't care if it's 1% you're believing in the works. I don't care if it's what works only for a thousand years. I don't care if you're believing in works for the people who are going to be in, during the end times. 
You're not saved because you're not believing the right gospel. Bottom line, period. So look at verse number 7 in Revelation 2. The Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So you see, it's only, the only people who are going to have access to that tree of life are those that overcome. But see, they'll take that term and just define it how they want to define it and say, well, it's those who are living a good life. They actually have overcome. Verse number 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. They'll say, see, people who don't quite overcome, they will be hurt of the second death. And again, They'll try to plant that definition of what overcome means in your mind. And then verse number 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. The problem is, is that they just ignore or want to brush off what the Bible says it means to overcome. Now, it's also just important to note this as well because you know, they, they always want to point out who the audience is and who the Bible's talking about and stuff. Great. Well, you know what? The book of Revelation is recorded and written down by John, the Apostle John. As were the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as the Gospel of John. And in Revelation, all of those references to him that overcomes, John already defined what overcomes means in 1 John chapter 5. Verse number 2, the Bible says in 1 John 5, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments and His commandments were not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I thought it was our good works and obedience to God's law that makes us overcome. That's what these people are trying to teach that Revelation 2 is talking about. Well, John said in another book, no, this is he that overcomes. Whosoever, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And the victory that, that overcometh the world is our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's who's overcome the world. That's who it is that overcomes. That's who it is that shall not be hurt of the second death. And amazingly enough, this fits perfect with the whole rest of the Bible. <laughs> There's no other, there is no contradiction anywhere else in Scripture. Now turn if you would to Revelation chapter 20. It's the last place I want you to look at. Because I don't think that Faust believes what I'm going to say here because he, uh, he's not quite as stupid as the folks at, at Great Harvest are as far as just intellectually and seeing some very, very obvious... I mean, he's stupid enough to not see all the obvious contradictions in Scripture, but that's just because he's not saved. Okay, but he has a little bit more intellect than to say this. But I, I heard these guys saying that, you know, you're going to go to the lake of fire You'll be cast in a lake of fire because their name's not going to be in the book of life. But you're going to be going to that lake of fire for those thousand years. Well, the lake, people being cast in a lake of fire doesn't happen until after the millennial reign of Christ. And that is clear just from the context of where you even find any references to those events at all. Because it's like only found in Revelation chapter 2. You don't have a bunch of other places that talk about this event other than in Revelation 20. So look at Revelation 20, verse number 7. It says, And when the thousand years are expired, the thousand years that Jesus rules and reigns on this earth, when those years are ended, that's what expired means, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, and when they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The beast and the false prophet are the first two that go into the lake of fire. They're there for that whole millennial reign. And then the devil gets cast into the lake of fire where they already are 
And then it says in verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, as I mentioned earlier, the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. If you're in Christ, you're not going to be judged according to your works. You'll be judged according to his works. The dead are judged according to their works. And then it says in verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Remember Jesus said, I'll never cast you out. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. These people are lifted up in pride just to want to feel even partially responsible for their own salvation, be able to look down on other people for not living a righteous life or trying to make an explanation for what's going to happen to them. Because God's justice system isn't good enough for them. It's not good enough for them to say, well, whatsoever men sow it, that shall he also reap and understand that God will take care of you know, those carnal Christians that are not living the way that they're supposed to live in this lifetime. But at the end of the day, they still have an inheritance because they're a child of God. They're an heir. And they're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And if they're born again, guess what? The Holy Spirit resides within them. So you mean to tell me that that born again child of God that has the Holy Spirit residing in them is the Holy Spirit then going to be burning in hell with them for a thousand years? I mean, the Bible says, I will never leave them nor forsake them. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. In Hebrews 13. It's a dumb doctrine. It's a doctrine of devils. Don't get caught up into this garbage. Be careful where you get your, your teachings from. Look, I'm a fan of listening to preaching and just finding more and learning more as much as I can, as much as anyone else. I love it. I really love just learning more about the Bible and Scripture. And it's great to have teachers and people that can help you learn the Bible. Be, be careful who you're listening to. The biggest mistake you can make is just look at someone and say, well, they're King James only, so I'm just going to listen to them. And look, oh, look, a lot of people have been deceived by that. And especially if you're a younger believer, you'll be deceived by that. You got to watch out because it's, it's not just about that one thing. Or just because someone gives lip, lip service to once saved, always saved, doesn't mean that they're a good person you want to be listening to. You got to really try the spirits and, and test them out and see, you know, if you're going to read a book from someone, who is that person? You know, uh, I mean, a, a, a doctrine taught book. There's someone who's writing doctrines. Like Joey Faust. Don't just say, oh, this is a book about doctrine and he's a Baptist, so I'll just read it and, you know. I mean, you read something, be very, very skeptical, first of all, but it's a really good idea just to know who it is that's writing the information. Because these guys have, are, are very cunning in their devices and, and will deceive the simple. And we don't want to be simple. We want to, know, we want to know the truth. But the best way to, to not be simple is just to get it straight from God's word. That's the best way. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the crystal clear teaching of our salvation by faith alone, uh, by grace alone, dear Lord, and all the glory being to Jesus Christ. And truly, he deserves all the credit, all the glory, all the honor, Lord, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. I think that's just another verse that, that, they don't, that these people don't like to think about or turn to when they're considering how their own works are going to keep them from going to hell. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to stand firm in the good doctrines which we've received and to mark and avoid those that deny these, these 
damnable that to deny the truth and teach damnable heresies lord um, help us increase our wisdom and i pray that you please strengthen our church and, and lord this afternoon help us to reach many people with the gospel of jesus christ that they could be born again today and uh and know you as their savior it's in jesus name we pray amen